So I'll, I'll try to be that patented combination of quick and confusing, um, or sorry, quick and non-confusing. <laughs> so starting with classification, MV classification, and I'm using the turtle data. And you'll notice in this folder, I have two folders of data. We're not using, I don't think I use Mike's Chinook salmon data anymore. So we've got Jolicoeur and Moseman. Um, that's got painted turtles data in different forms, including our form uh, that I've read it in. And uh, we also have uh, Ronald Fisher's iris data. This is a classic, I think I might've mentioned this, but don't remember. Um, so R.A. Fisher, the person who the F test is named after, you know, one of those racist biometrician guys. Um, he developed discriminant function analysis and MANOVA. And I think it was first used on this iris data. These are three species of iris, the flower, the plant, and the flower. And um, I think there's four things measured on each one. So we'll, we'll look at DFA with that. So it's kind of fun to work on that historical data set and then the Jolicoeur and Moseman uh, turtle data as well. So with uh, classification, as usual, I'm just going to run the sucker and pray that it works. And then we'll go back and kind of quickly see what happened. Cool. Okay. And I won't spend a ton of time on this because, like I said, um, very, very rare. So I'm kind of doubtful anybody will actually use this in research. I really wanted to see it to kind of start to get your head into how multivariate works. So um, start at the very beginning and just reading in the data set. I've noticed a couple of times, so be careful because I've started using the attach command in uh, in my scripts, and that's line seven here. So the reason for that, if you don't know already, is when you're naming variables in a data set, um, the usual way to name them is the name of the data set, dollar sign, and the name of the variable. And so by saying attach, and the data set name, you don't have to do the turtles dollar sign thing, you can just say link. So it's kind of presuming that the you're looking at the turtles data set, which is wonderful. I think it was you, Omar, I might have been one of the other <laughs> students in my lab. Um, we got sort of burned by that because you say attach and then you start using another data set down below. And it, yeah, I guess it's happened more than once. <laughs> but um, so be careful when you use the attach command, it can be handy, but it can also kind of, well, everybody knows now how R can be somewhat obscure when you make an error. Like it takes you three hours to figure out that you are missing a comma or something. Anyway, um, so this, this uh, classification, remember I talked about distance matrices and I wanted to deal with not not uh, putting things, you know, calculating the distance based on raw measurements, but because that would lead to the more variable measurements having more say about how different or similar two objects were. So that's where I calculate Z scores. You might remember these from, you know, there's there's probably still profs who bell marks. They I think they did in high school and stuff like that. You know, where you create a Z score, you uh, subtract the mean. And then you divide by the standard deviation. That's in uh, line 10 there for length. Um, so that's something to do. Again, if, you're, if your uh, variables are measured in different units, that's putting all of them on the same footing in terms of the variance of each variable is then equal to one. The mean is zero. But you still have the values in there varying, like length width and height, it's just the variability in them has been standardized. So that's equal for all of them. So I do that in lines nine to 12. Um, I, I just, lines 14 to 16, 
are just defining an informative uh, label to put. You can see the dendrogram over there on the right. I, I just put it sideways just because of the configuration of, of this data that will probably work out well for you as well. Um, so, you know, for the same kind of dendrogram I showed you in the lecture, you have to kind of go like this, but it's the same idea that very similar turtle shells are being grouped and then groups or individuals are sort of aggregating as you move up in that hierarchical classification there. Um, so, so the uh, tags that I put on uh, each, each uh, value um, is, yeah, that's what line 15 is about. And then the Z turtles is just a vector, sorry, a, a matrix of the three variables, uh, Z score for length, Z score for width, Z score for height. And then the, the real, it's funny with these multivariate, there's usually like two lines maybe that is the meat of the whole thing. The rest of it, and Omar and I have dealt with this for weeks now, where most of what you do, you're, you're fiddling around with the data or you're fiddling around with a plot, trying to get a plot to work. And somewhere in the middle, there's a line or maybe two that's the actual analysis that you're doing. And anyway, so the calculation of the distance matrix that I was talking about last week is line 22 there. So this H class turtles, I'm sorry, line, line 19 is the distance matrix. So it's calculating a distance matrix of all the turtles using the Z scores for each of the three shell dimensions um, and method equals Euclidean. That's just, you know, remember, I couldn't remember whether it was Euclid or Pythagoras, the distance between two points is, you know, the square root of the square of this distance plus this distance, that, that thing. So that's how it's bringing together those, me those three measurements in one distance measure between every pair of turtles. Then the classification, the guts of the classification is happening in line 22. That's the method it's using to do that hierarchical step-by-step -step classification. Then the line 24 to 30, I don't know why I got that plus sign there. That seems like a mistake. Let me take that out and rerun it. I better not do it. It's bad luck. It still works. Oh, <laughs> that mistake. Um, yeah. Um, that, that's just drawing out the dendrogram, the results of the uh, classification analysis. So, and including, you know, you can see a line in there where I've said, draw a red line, line 40. That's where I say, okay, I want to draw a dashed line because I think that's where my real groups are, three real groups. And so draw a dashed line where uh, distance equals um, 1.5. So I do that. That's fine that the classification is done. And I want to save for each turtle shell, which of those three groups it was actually classified into. And that's what's happening in the uh, lines 46 to 48 there. So this won't be the same for you, Ness. You might, like, you might run your classification, Omar, and you'll see, oh, I've got four groups. So you're going to change, alter that line to be K equals four in line 47. So it'll tag each individual observation with which of the groups that it fell into of those four. Um, and then I start doing some uh, classifications to see whether the groupings of turtle shells actually corresponded with um, things I know about their habitat or their sex. And this is, again, something you do. What I'm doing here is just there, there was nothing forcing the classification to correspond to female male turtles or forest versus river turtles. So I'm seeing how much they 
they correlate. So let me show you down below, because when you do non-graphical results, they come out in the console down in the lower left corner there. And so there's the result, I'm showing it now. You've got the sex have combinations, female forest, female river, male forest, male river. And you can see that, um, uh, where is it? So male turtles were, there was no male turtles in, oh, I'm in the wrong one, hang on. <laughs> There. So we've got the sex habitat groups in the console, and we've got the three hierarchical dendrogram groups there, the, the columns. And notice there's uh, 24 male turtles, 23 of them are in group three. Right? Everybody see that? That table down below in the lower left corner. We got 11 of the male forest turtles and 12 of the male river turtles are in group three of the dendrogram. Only one of the males was in any other group than three, and that's the one male that was in group one. Um, there's seven of the females, they're all river females are in group three. So this is what you do, you know, you're, you've got some other kind of information about each of your objects and you're seeing whether the classification corresponds or seems to correspond in any way with that other information. That's what I'm doing here and saying, yeah, the, the big break has something to do with sexual dimorphism, as far as I can tell here. Okay. And just yell at me if I say something that um, doesn't make sense. So to show that, you know, I, I always like a figure more than a table. So what you're looking at there in the plotting area, which is what all of what line uh, 53 to 63 is about, is for each of those combos of sex and habitat, which of the three clusters did they fall in? And, and you can see the males are the two top plots. So most overwhelmingly, all but one of the males were in group three. And females, yeah, there's, I guess, more of them in groups one and two, but there's still a few of the river ones that fell in group group three. So that, to me, that graphical uh, approach, I don't know, it has more impact for me than the, the table, but either one would do if you're writing a paper about this. Okay, so... The next thing we do is this k-means thing, which I, you know, I didn't take the time to uh, talk about it at all in the, in the lecture. But this is another method of classification, and in this method, instead of sort of building up from the whole, you know, individual turtle shells up to one big massive group, what you do is you say, I, you know what, find me the best three groups of turtles, you know, the clearest three groups. And the approach it uses, it's, it's pretty, actually intuitively pretty simple. And I actually talked about it. I don't think anybody here took my GIS course a couple of years ago, but um, what you do is you, you have the mass of turtles, you know, in three dimensions here, and you arbitrarily put three points randomly that are gonna be the three centroids of your three groups that you're looking for and you classify every turtle as to how close they are to you know the closest point they are to that and then you get the mean of the ones that were classified to groups one two or three and then you use that as the centroid you go around again anyway you you hone it and hone it so basically the idea behind the method is I want the most distinct three groups of turtles that you can find. But again, not doing it hierarchically, but sort of tweaking, honing this uh, classification with a known number of groups. So that's that's what I'm doing in um, line 69 there. And again, it's like one line does the k-means uh, clustering, sorry, line 66. 
And then what I do is same thing I did with the uh, hierarchical clustering with k-means uh, classification is look at, and you can see it in the plot there, what are the frequencies of um, the males from the forest and the river? You know, how, how much correspondence is there from those three groups that k-means plus classification found uh, with the sex and habitat? And it actually looks like k-means did not correspond as much to um, the sex and habitat as the hierarchical classification did. So there's the table you see in the console there, and then you see the corresponding uh, plot on the on the right. And then the final plot is um, what's the agreement or lack of agreement between, you know, in both of those classification techniques you ended up, we ended up with three groups. And I just want to see, well, did they kind of agree with each other or not? And um, it looks like to some extent, so all of the um, k-means cluster uh, group one turtle shells were either in hierarchical cluster group one or two. Um, so there's, there's some correspondence there. All of the group two k-means uh, turtle shells were in group three of hierarchical clusters. So there's some agreement between the groups that they distinguish, but there's also some fuzz there. So, so that's what I want you to do with classification in your lab. And then uh, NMDS ordination. which is logically called NMDS ordination. And we'll run that. First of all, save and shut down MV classification so I don't get confused. And I see, I always obliterate what's in the console. I take the broom out and get rid of plots from the previous one, because otherwise my mind gets too cluttered. Okay, so we'll, I'll, I'll run the ordination and it'll be a little bit faster because um, we already saw the standardization, which I do that as well, and uh, the calculation of the distance matrix. So yeah, if you focus on line 33, that's again, calculating the distance matrix again with for in preparation for the ordination. So it happens to be using a different function for the same thing, but um, still doing the thing where every pair of turtle shells is distinguished by how different their, uh, their shell length, height, and width is. And then the, the business part of doing the ordination is line 44. That's it. So the whole the whole thing, remember I did the, the points start randomly, and then you figure out the stress, then you tweak them a bit, and then you figure out the stress again, and around and around you go until you get that optimal low dimension picture, which is essentially like a sketch of the distance matrix. Um, that's what's happening in line 44. It's, it's working on the distance matrix the same way that the hierarchical clustering worked on the distance matrix in the previous script. So if we go back and look at the uh, plots that I generate from that, we've got the ordination. So remember in this one, this is the one that's um, hard to explain to your supervisor or your examining committee. That is the, uh, yeah. Flavia, can you explain to me what the X and Y axes are? Well, you know, really the X and Y axes, they're not important here. And then your examiner looks at you like, you gotta be kidding me. You've got to explain what you're plotting. And anyway, remember for ordination, the important thing is how different the points are in space, that we have a more tightly grouped of males over here and a somewhat more scattered group of females on the left side there. And every distance between them is reflecting differences in their shell dimensions. There's no other information in there. 
and it's portraying it quite well. And you get within the uh, output of the ordination, if I just scroll up a little bit, you find out what the stress was. And there's, you know, the rules of thumb about how, what's a big or a low, uh, small stress and all that, that kind of stuff. Um, and if you're going to use this in any research context, I can refer you to stuff to, to check that out. But that that's ordination using non-metric multidimensional scaling. And I just, for interest sake, and this is where we see the SPLOM again, same plot I was showing you before, a um, little bit of a different uh, format for those uh, frequency distributions along the diagonal of each uh, each dimension, but you have, in this case, the ordination scores are those last two. And so you can see how, how related uh, each of the original measurements are to them. Okay, we're, we're cooking with gas here. And again, if I, just stop me if I uh, talk about something and it's, not making sense, or certainly talk to me about it when you try to do it, that's not making sense. Okay, so PCA, the bread. And in this case, uh, yeah, we're using the turtle data. And I'm gonna quickly run it because this is a bit of a change from doing the distance matrix. In this case, rather than looking at a distance matrix, we sort of flip things on their side where we look at either variances and covariances of the original variables or correlations between them. You know, what I was talking about in the lecture about whether or not you're interested in variances as well as correlations or just correlations. So we'll see how that works here in a sec. But let me just run it. Yep. PCA can be either. So um, I think the first time, yeah, I'm doing it on the co covariance matrix this time, and I'll show you how it's very simple to change to the correlation, which again, if, you're, if your quantitative variables are measured in different units, you have to use the correlation matrix. There's no choice because you don't want it to be an analysis of, you know, different units have different amount of variability, nothing to do with science or anything. It's just how you've measured things, the scale of measurement. Um, or you could tell me, yeah, I'm just interested in correlation. So then use that, but I'll show you where that, that choice is made. But meanwhile, um, here are the plots that I generate for the PCA. So, and I showed you the, couple of these were in the, uh, or a version of them were in the lecture. This is just the first principal component or that major gradient is along the x-axis. The second one is along the y-axis. And again, every turtle shell is plotted on that. So this is like they've, they've been replotted on those new axes that I found. Um, the results that are over here in the, in the console, show you, and, and this is a slice of that slide that I was, uh, this was on my PCA slides, where, where you see the amount of variability along each principal component axis and the role that each original variable played in defining each of those principal component axes. The second plot that you get is the scree plot. Anybody know why it's called scree? Or anybody know what scree is? S C R E E. Does it ring a bell? Any mountain climbers here? So um, the bottom of a mountain, you know, there tends to be kind of rubble at the bottom that collects, sometimes called glacial scree or whatever, and it kind of falls off the cliff and kind of settles out um, away from the cliff. So when you're looking at that scree plot on the right, that can vary a lot in how quickly it 
descends. It's always going to be the first gradient is always going to be the highest um, bar there because what you're plotting is variance on the y-axis, you know, the amount of spread on the axis, and just the the component principal component number on the x-axis. So the first one's the biggest, and then they're going to get smaller and smaller as you go down through you know orthogonal dimensions. And remember with the uh, the turtle data, it was like, yeah, that first one's really important. There's 98.6% of the variation explained there. But the second and third, it's it's the baguette, right? There's there's not much difference between them. See how they're about the same size. Um, and that's indicative, that's that flat zone I was talking about. But with some of you, when you do do your PCA, you'll get a second bar that's kind of up here. You know, it'll be, won't be as big as the first one, never is, but it'll have some size to it. And that's saying, yeah, there's there's important variation there. It's not a baguette, it's more like an Italian loaf. There's There's kind of another gradient there to interpret. So, yeah. Would I be telling them about, like, let's say here my second and third axis, would I still, like, be telling them about it, like, like oh, I'm not going to Yes, so, so, yeah, generally speaking, in a, in a paper about it, like, I would say, yeah, the first axis was increasing precipitation and decreasing June and, and July temperature. Um, second and further axes were not interpretable they're random variation you know that that kind of thing here just as the exercise you know i, I plot the second axis and and interpret it but yeah if it, it, it's kind of like um if you're not seeing a trend you don't describe the nature of it that's kind of a bad way to put it but yeah the judge the first judgment is how many gradients do I have interpretable gradients? And then, oh, I might do like a weather index using PCA, but I'm only going to eat like it's going to be based on PC1. I'm not going to use PC2 to 10 because they're just random variation. Well, yeah, you'd only mention the point to say, yeah, the first PC explained 95% of the variation. Subsequent, we're just random variation, you know, that that kind of a thing. So we've got the scree plot, and then uh, then I just did another splom, and I, I talked about this in in class where you um, you can see the lack of correlation between PC one and two. They're the the bottom two um, variables that are that are plotted there, and the the degree to which the original variables play a part in defining PC one there in that second last row of of uh, plots. Okay, so and and again, I don't think. Well, let me just take one sec. It, within the um, within the script, um, again, the the business end of the PCA is this line right here, line fourteen where I ask it to calculate scores. So I'm asking it to plot each of those turtle shells along those new axes and see where it says core equals false. So that means I'm using the covariance matrix. So if I say, if I say core equals true and run it again, we'll look at how things change. So we've still got, I mean, the story going on here is about correlation, right? It's, it's again, it hasn't changed the story of little shells to big shells. Look at the splom. You see length, width, height. They're all very much, very strongly positively correlated with the first principal component axis. Um, and 
none of them are related to in any strong way to principal component axis two. If we look at the actual, uh, well, let me look at the screen plot for a sec. It's it's basically the same, maybe a titch higher in PC2, but really not much. And look at the loadings over on the left there. So now they're very similar because remember what I said, when you're doing the correlation matrix, no longer is it about differences in variation, it's just correlation. And so they're they're all very similar positive in that first axis. There's a kind of a shape, positive and negative in the second axis, but it's sort of random variation anyway. So um, again, we're not getting radically different stories from the two PCAs here. It can happen that you do get radically different stories. So that's, and when you measure things in the same units, like oftentimes, and this is true of many analyses, the, ver the way things vary and co-vary is much more interesting than the way or the amount that they differ one group to the next. So it's kind of like uh, one, one paper I did once, we think about the bread, <laughs> you know, think about the panini buns when I was doing the analogy with uh, DFA and MANOVA, you know, the difference between the two panini buns in terms of two male and female turtle shells. Well, sometimes the panini buns are different shapes and different orientation. If you think about this, so it's like saying males have different variability and co-variability of dimensions than females. So one analysis, and I, I used to get folks to do this in the, in the lab, don't think I do anymore, is you do a PCA within the group and you compare the results of the PCA between groups as opposed to just comparing the means of the groups. And it can be as interesting scientifically as just, oh, gee, I wonder if males differ from females. Just think about it. how do the gradients differ within males and females can be as interesting a question. Okay, speaking of which, in the last few minutes, let's do the DFA because it's, it's really cool. And it's a script I found somewhere and that's, it's a good lesson for, especially when we get into MBA, we'll talk about some um, kind of more recent novel techniques uh, next week. There's so much that's out there if you're doing something, whether, and whether it's analysis or graphics or whatever that you can find scripts for. And that's, I'm pretty sure that's where I got one of the, one of the cool scripts in the, uh, in the DFA script. So let's have a look at it. Um, Manova DFA. Okay. So I'll save the PCA one, shut it down, take all the PCA results away, clean off my desk. modeling good behavior. So in this case, I'm using that classic uh, iris data from Fisher. So I'll run it and then I'll, I'll show you the data set once I've run it. Before we look at the output, um, here I have Iris. There we go. So if you look at the top left, and there's a couple of things going on here which I think are useful, like if if you use this for research purposes. So I've, I've uh, got the data set stored as an R data set. I've labeled each variable because I always, like I like to stay organized and remember the definition of each, the units they're measured in, that, that sort of thing. So sepal, if you remember your botany, sepals and petals. So we've got length and width of sepals and we've got length and width of petals and we have, um, I think it's four species. Setosa, versicolor, and virgin, three species of iris. And then at the end, 
Um, remember, we were finding an axis. We found an axis with PCA that described the major gradients in the in a group of observations. With DFA, we're finding an axis that best distinguishes groups. And just like PCA, and I didn't I didn't really talk about this. So you can get more than one axis in DFA. So you find the best, in this case, we've got three groups. If you only have two groups, there's just one axis that's gonna best distinguish them when you replot them. But in this case with three groups, we can actually find the best axis for distinguishing the three groups and the second best axis for distinguishing them, which I don't know, just my nature, but I found that cool. Um, so let's look at the extremely cool results and then I'll go back and show you how I got it. So there's, we've calculated the uh, DF scores, just the score for each of those individual plants on each of those original, you know, using the four measurements, length and width of sepal, length and width of petal. And we've got the DF1, the best axis at distinguishing them is on the X axis. And the second best axis at distinguishing them is on the, on the Y axis. And I don't know, I think it's amazing. So uh, we've got these three species and Setosa is obviously super different from the other two, uh, but Virginica and Versicolor they're quite distinct and all three of them really are being separated out on that first axis. The first axis seems to be doing all the work. See how the others, if you look sideways at it, it's not really distinguishing the three groups at all. So if we go back and look at how I got to this, up in the top left there. So just read in the data. Um, if I wanted to do uh, just two groups, that's what lines 12 to 13, I'm just, I, I could pull out Virginica just to illustrate just doing two groups, but uh, we're just using all three in this case. And that's the technique I think everybody's used of just hashtag the front of the line if you wanna take it out of action temporarily or permanently, or, or obviously put a comment in. Um, I've got species as a factor, and then I just do the univariate ANOVAs. And that's just the same old one-way ANOVA that you know and love. So if I look at the results down below, you're looking at a basic one-way ANOVA for length of the steeple, width of the sepal, length of the petal, width of the petal. They're all significantly different among the three species. And then you get in this one line here, line 34 is the MANOVA. That's answering the question, are the groups different with respect to the four quantitative variables, response variables? And the answer to that is here, and it's kind of a, a multivariate analog to ANOVA, something called Palais Trace. And there you can see highly significant, and this tends to be a super sensitive, powerful test. So um, oftentimes you'll get a significant difference when it's really obscure as to how and, and why they're different. But anyway, then the interesting part is we know now, yeah, there seems to be evidence that they're different. How are they different? And it tells us, in this coefficient of linear discriminants, the role, again, the role that each variable is playing, the length of the sepal, width of the sepal, length of the petal, width of the petal. You can see that sepal are positively weighted for that first discriminant axis and petal measurements are negatively weighted. So something about the shape of the, or the relative size of the petal and the sepal are distinguishing the three species. And here's where we get into really interesting <laughs> terrain. And it's really how in almost every case, people, people sort of give an indication of how well the DFA distinguish their groups. That little matrix that you see, it says DF, 
A dot posterior class and then Setosa versicola virginica, it's saying, okay, if you only had the, the sepal and the petal measurements, how good would it do? How good a job would it do at classifying them into the species they really were? So if I didn't know anything else, I just had these four measurements. And what that's saying is that 50 of the Satosa, of the 50 Satosa were properly classified just using the measurement, those four measurements. Just to, having those four numbers. Uh, 48 of the 49, sorry, 48 of the 50 Versicolor and 49 of the 50 uh, Virginica. And so you've got that, it's called a, sometimes called a confusion or a classification matrix. And that sort of jives with what we're seeing in that plot on the right, right? So Satosa is just right, it's totally different. And Virginica and Versicolor, well, there's a tiny bit of overlap and you're seeing that in both that matrix and that plot on the right of the scores. So what people do, this is, this is great, but it's kind of cheating in a way because you're using the same data to sort of figure out where those axes are. And then in terms of determining how good the classification was in that, in that uh, confusion matrix that you see there, um, what some people do is say, okay, I'm gonna take my discriminant model and I'm gonna apply it to a bunch of plants that I didn't use to determine where the axis was. Same three species, I'm gonna just bring them in and measure them and then calculate where they would go on the discriminant axis. I didn't use them to figure out where the axis was, but I'm gonna bring them in separately. It's, it's kind of like when you do a regression model and you bring in data that you didn't use to build the regression model to see how well it works on data that didn't train the model. And it's the ultimate and, and becoming much more common in all types of modeling now where uh, it's almost considered not cheating, but it's, it's, it's a better judgment of the model if you use some data that weren't, weren't used to build the model to test the model. And that, that's very common now. Anyway, that's not happening here, but that gives us a great idea there of how well the discriminant axes did distinguish them. It, I doubt you're gonna see that good a distinction in your data sets, but, but we'll see. So that's that, um, that's that script. I think the, the part that actually does the wonderful plot that you see there underneath, it's this long convoluted script. Um, I would just sort of take it at face value. It's taking the output. If you have uh, either two or three groups that you're distinguishing, um, it, it'll either draw the sort of plot that you see there. Or if you only have two groups, let me show you. I'll just turn that, turn that line on and we'll just pick out two species. So you'll see the difference. Because if you only have two groups, as I was saying, um, then it can't find two discriminant axes. It can just find one. So let, let's try that and see if it works. Whoops. The deadly capital letter. Okay, I'm gonna have to, I'll, I'll twig that one. It's one of these infamous R rabbit holes that I have to go down. But anyway, um, talk to me if you, if you do only have two groups or if you're trying to get down to three groups to do this, uh, do this DFA. And sorry, I went over time, <laughs> but uh, yeah, let me know if you get, started on uh, on lab three and uh, I will see you next week. Yeah, Flavia. Yeah, you can do it. You have the power.
Yeah, and as usual, let me know if you get stuck.